Hello and welcome. We are going to get started with this really fun uh, food story that I'm going to share with you today. We have an uh, afternoon just packed with cooking and interesting talk conversation and I just want to make sure we have time for everything. Okay, so welcome. Uh, so my name is uh, Chef Maxine and I'm the Culinary Program Director at your region Food Network. Uh, my cultural background is Canadian. Um, my family, however, is from Barbados. So I'm second, first generation Canadian of Barbados descent. And uh, we thought that making these food stories is a really great way to connect one another and even ourselves with our culture and just kind of bringing people together around these wonderful stories. So I'm gonna share a little bit uh, about mine. Okay, so I went to culinary school. And in culinary school, I learned to brine. So I learned to brine my meat. Um, you know, what does that mean? So brining is a way to retain moisture in your protein, so your animal protein. You submerge it in a salt solution, um, and it just adds like, real flavor. But then I thought, historically, this is something that people do in the Afro-Caribbean diaspora for millennia. But we do it in a slightly different way. We do it uh, by when we have our poultry or our meat, for example, we're gonna add some lime and some salt to that dish. And we're gonna let that sit in that water. Um, if you ask anybody, they'll tell you, oh, it's because we uh, are cleaning the meat. But you know what? When I looked at it, it's the same principle as brining. It's retaining that moisture in the meat. It's imparting flavor. But you know what? We've been told we're not allowed to do that. If you go on a Public Health Canada website, it says very clearly, you do not wash your chicken or your meat. And the reason being, there's this concern that bacteria is going to kind of get around your home and cause potential illness. And I just thought that that was an interesting uh, point because we're taught to brine, but this is wrong. Okay, uh, I went to nutrition school. So I went to nutrition school and I learned the benefits of eating whole foods. I learned all about fermentation and how fermented foods are great for the gut and for the digestion. But then I thought again, and again, that wasn't really the case. If you look in uh, Africa, there is a long, long, long history of fermentation. If you go to the East Coast of um, Africa, we learn all about fermentation, fermentation through uh, the traditional bread in Jira. This is a fermented bread made from a whole grain called teff. So again, hmm, I thought, why are we seeking these things outside when these things are here? I've been told that coconut is a superfood. Coconut is amazing, it's a superfood. First we were told that coconut was bad and it was wrong for us. Um, but that's because people got hold of it and instead of enjoying it in its sort of natural state, it got processed and refined to the point where it did become harmful uh, to our bodies. But now I'm being told that coconut is good for us. Something that we've, I've known for, for years. We use it on our skin, we use it in our hair, it's great for your digestion, we eat it, uh, and we use it on everything. And so now I'm told that coconut is a superfood. So I thought, hmm, that was pretty interesting as well. Um, you know, that's where my food story begins. So I'm going to share a photo with you. I'm going to share a photo with you. I'm going to come around here so you can see. So my food story begins right here. Uh, the lady on, I don't know if it's the left or the right, but in the blue, the lady in the blue, that is my grandma. Uh, her name is Evelyn Elaine Bowen. And the lady on the other side in the pink, uh, her name is Aunt Pearl. So this is my great Aunt Pearl. 
So all, where my food story begins, it begins with these two amazing ladies and the culture and the history and the knowledge that they take forward uh, has really helped to write my story. Uh, as growing up in Canada, where we kept our tradition alive is through uh, Elaine Grand's cooking. So we learned all about uh, Caribbean food through her cooking. And she shared those things with us orally. And she showed us how to do it. One of my fondest food memories uh, wasn't with uh, my grandmother, but it was with one of our family friends. And she was from Trinidad and Tobago. And I remember as a child uh, making dalpuri roti in her house music blaring, stove on, we would make curry, we would make dal puri roti, we keep it in the freezer, and we would spend the entire day doing it. So these are things that are history and they're connected to us. And I realize um, Caribbean and African people are very expressive. I can barely keep my hands still <laughs> as I'm talking to you right now, but we're really expressive people. And um, Oftentimes you can't find written recipes. Now we're starting to more and more as that documentation is starting to happen. But it's like, because we don't cook from, words don't have experience behind them, right? You feel, so you're shown. You're shown how to make things. You're shown what to look for. You're shown how to smell, how to taste. And so there's like a deep, rich cultural history in there. We've learned uh, as, you know, my grandmother would go out and get a bush for your achy tummy or to help you to sleep. And Aunt Pearl, Aunt Pearl at this point, she is going to be 99 years old this year. So she must know a thing or two about food. So I just thought that that was, um, that's sort of the beginning of my food story and I wanted to share that with you today. Okay, so what we're gonna do, I wanted to outline what we're gonna do today. Uh, so in front of me, I have the amazing ingredients to create a very traditional soup. So it's a Caribbean style soup, and it's very uh, affectionately known as soup. That, that is pretty much what we call it. And there's as many variations of this soup as there are people who make it. So there's lots of different variations of this soup, and as many people as they are, that's as many variations, which is kind of um, a lot of where uh, our sort of food culture comes from. And it's an experience, and we feel it, and we use what's available. So that's kind of cool. So before we start, even this humble pot of soup does have uh, a history. So it has a history. And I'm just going to take a minute and I'm gonna read something from this book. It's called Provisions. It's called Provisions. And uh, the uh, author is, there's two, uh, two uh, Michelle Rousseau and Suzanne Rousseau, they're sisters. And they are the author of this beautiful book. I love the word provision, um, you know, cause it means to take care of. And what we used to do, what um, in the Caribbean, and I believe in Africa as well on the continent, um, we called root vegetables ground provisions. And that's because this is what provided the nutrients for uh, many meals, many families, many cultures during really hard and challenging times. And to this day, that continues and moves forward. So also, um, before I read this, actually, I have one other uh, source of my food that, that um, lends to my food history, my food story. Uh, and that's on the, my grandpa, my grandpa George. So that is my dad's father. And grandpa George had a huge provision ground. He, um, there was, my dad is one of 14 kids and they grew all of these vegetables. Um, and that was what he used to care for his family. So caring for the land, tending for the land, um, reaching for that food and providing that food is something that is very common um, if you look to our history. So I'm going to read for a second from this book, Provision, and it's going to talk a little bit about what the significance of this pot of soup is, and then sort of how um, it transcends. Okay, so I won't read all, 
Um, this is a beautiful book because not only does it have these gorgeous recipes inside, but it also has lots of history. So it has history about our food, our culture in the West Indies. These two ladies are from Jamaica. So the story kind of takes um, a fold from like a Jamaican perspective, but it really can be translated throughout, like all throughout the Caribbean. Okay, so I'm gonna read this little part. Um, there is like a dis, um, like a, a huge divide between sort of the plantation plantation kitchen and where the uh, house and the house and the house cook where the slaves were. So the plantation kitchen must have been bustling with activity. These elaborate they prepared elaborate meals uh, by the home cook, usually a woman whose skills were such that she could produce an incredible gourmet feast from a simple brick oven and an open flame. So this is talking about how historically um, plantation owners coming from like colonialists, coming from Europe, they would often want to replicate some of the banquets and the feasts that you would find in Europe. And obviously they didn't have the cooks and the chefs from that place. And so these uh, women, um, these slave women would then take on that responsibility of having to create these really elaborate gourmet meals so that they can entertain uh, aristocrats and friends. Um, so if extravagant banquets with a copious variety of dishes were the norm, and they all had to be produced in rudimentary cooking facilities. Accordingly, a West Indian banquet featured a balance of both room temperature and hot items, a tradition that lives on in the Caribbean table today. By contrast, slave meals were meager and modest prepared by the matriarch. Despite her many hours of work on the plantation, a woman slave was also responsible for the preparation of meals in her own home, as well as for the maintenance of her home and the simple but necessary chores like laundry, sewing, cleaning. Spare kitchen facilities, rustic cooking, cooking utensils, and lack of time made meal preparation for slaves a relatively simple, efficient, tasks that centered around a single pot over an open flame. This style of cooking produced two main types of nourishment, well-seasoned, hearty one-pot dishes like soups, stews, porridges, and pap, and simple flame roaches, roasted starches served with salted fish. These dishes were all often called the Negro pot. Okay, so that is our intro to this beautiful soup. So that Negro pot is something that you can find all throughout the Caribbean. And even to this day, people will be making their pot of soup uh, and it's always left on the stove. I showed you my uh, great aunt Pearl because to this day at her almost 99 years of life, if you go to her house, there will be something on the pot on the stove cooking and she does that so that anyone who is passing by can stop by her house and they know there's always something to eat so that looking out for community has always been a very prominent part in our culture okay so let's get ready to cook okay we're going to create our own version of this negro pot and i have a variety of ingredients here so um, if you can, if you know these vegetables, type it in the chat. Let's see who is up to par here. Okay, so I have this vegetable. I'm gonna try to come a little closer so you can see it. So I have this vegetable. Does anybody know what that is? I actually can't see. So Morgan, if someone does um, answer in the chat, um, just let me know, just shout it out. Okay. So we have this vegetable. We um, have someone has asked, or a couple people have said yam. Yeah. Um, there's no one yet. Sorry, I'm really bad at pronouncing anything, but yeah, tia, yeah, tia. Yuka. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have we have yam. 
Mayhem, we have Yuka. Okay, so those are some options. Okay, so whoever said yam, this is an African yam, so you're 100% correct. Now, again, just kind of looking at our food and how it's been sort of taken away and replaced. I'm going to show you something. Okay, so this is an African yam. I'm sure everybody recognizes this as a sweet potato. Uh, does anybody know what this is? No, no options? Okay, so this is, uh, this one here is um, a Caribbean sweet potato as well. And so this, um, this is what in, in Africa people would be used to, is eating this um, African yam. Um, and so as an attempt in the Americas to kind of satisfy um, slaves' desire for their traditional foods, this sweet potato was introduced um, as like the same thing. And people were just told it's the same. But obviously it's not, like it looks different, the texture is different and the flavor is different. Sweet potatoes have a little bit more sweetness to it and the yam is a little bit more starchy. Uh, and then also we have here our uh, Caribbean sweet potato, which again has like a little bit more of a starchier content. Okay, so those are just, that's just another example. So I'm gonna get started with the cooking part um, while we talk about ingredients. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is get our pot nice and hot. And just as usual, I have uh, right here, I just have some onion and some celery and some garlic, and that's just been chopped up already. So we're going to get our pot hot, uh, add some oil. I'm just using some avocado oil today. Okay, so I'm going to add some oil. This is going right into the pot, and we're going to let that just kind of cook and simmer together. Thyme is another very common ingredient that you can find in the Caribbean. So this is some just fresh chopped thyme. There's actually um, a kind of thyme that's a broader leaf. It's called broad leaf thyme, but it has a very similar flavor. In most Caribbean islands, you're gonna find thyme as a prominent flavor. Okay, so I have this. And I'm gonna just cook that along because I wanna develop my flavors. I'm gonna cook that along with my onion, celery, and garlic. And then I have my secret ingredient here. Does anyone know what this is? It's hard to tell because it's in a jar. If anyone is of Caribbean descent, you will have an idea of what is in here. I'm not hearing anything, so I'm gonna say, no, you don't. Okay, so this is called seasoning. So this is, from every household, you will find someone with a big jar of seasoning somewhere in the fridge. And so this is a flavor base where all of the building layers and um, creating dimension in your food. And so this is a quick way where, again, uh, the women who used to do the cooking, they just kind of um, created this blend um, because if you just add that in, it just adds a beautiful flavor into your pot. So what's in here? What's in here is like onion, garlic, thyme, green onion, um, Scratch bonnet pepper. Uh, there is some nutmeg, some parsley. So again, just like with all the rest of the food, whatever um, for each household, there's going to be a recipe. So this is our family recipe here, and it's just a mix. It becomes like a paste, and you can make this, and it's going to last months in your fridge. And we use it to season our meat. Uh, we use it to season our stews, and I'm going to use it today to season our soup. So I'm, I'm being generous with it because I want like a nice flavor in my food. And I start all that all at the beginning because this is going to build our flavor as we go and then as we add our ingredients. So I'll give that a stir. It's already smelling delicious. And I'm just going to let that cook out. So in the meantime, we can look at what else I have here. So I talked about the yam, the sweet potato, and the Caribbean sweet potato. So I've cut a little bit of each of that up. So I have all that here. That's going to go into our soup. Today I'm doing it vegetarian, but you can add meat to it, any kind of meat, poultry. Um, we really enjoy it with goat, goat meat. Um, or you can add lamb. So whatever uh, you have on hand, you can use. So I'm going to put these in as soon as that's going. I have another vegetable here. Who knows what this one is? 
Again, Morgan, if anyone types in oh, what it is called, let me know. Okay, this is my other ingredient here. We have cassava as a guess. That is 100% right. So this is a cassava and it has another name as well. Who knows what the other name is? No, yucca. So this is yucca. So cassava and yucca are the same thing. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, sorry, cassava and yucca are the same thing. And so um, what's really cool about this, so cassava is like one is the third most cultivated crop in the world. Um, and you can find this everywhere. So it's definitely throughout the continent of Africa. It's definitely found in the Caribbean. Um, and then it's also uh, found like in Brazil and throughout Asia. Asia is used more like tapioca. So the tapioca is actually the starch from the cassava um, that's been dried and then it's used in like tapioca. So if you've ever heard of either of those things, this is all cassava and it's found in many, many different cultures. So, which is kind of cool. Um, again, it just shows how our, our food has traveled, how it's been influenced um, throughout the century. And throughout most cultures, you will find an Afro-Caribbean influence in most cultures. There's always, um, it, ha they, it, it has been influencing the cuisine for a really, really long time. Just a little dry from adding a little touch won't work. I'm turning my stove down to medium, just so nothing burns, but I really want to develop the flavors and let all the ingredients wet. So that's what's happening right now. And as I'm cooking, if anyone has any questions, just type it in the chat and then I'm happy to answer that. Okay. So here's our what is this? Does anybody have a, a guess? No guesses? Uh, habanero pepper? Yeah, or scotch bonnet. So habanero and scotch bonnet are the same. This is one of the hottest peppers and it's very commonly used, again, through um, in African and Caribbean cuisine um, because we like a little bit of heat. Now, if you're, these are very hot. So if you're someone who just likes the flavor but doesn't want intense heat in your food, what you can do and what I'm going to do today um, is leave it whole. So while when you add your water and everything and your soup is starting to, to simmer, then I'm going to add a whole scotch bonnet into the soup pot. And what it's going to do, it's going to take up the flavor and it's going to give you a little bit of heat without being intense. Okay, here's my, uh, here's my trivia question for everybody. Which part of the pepper is actually what makes it super spicy? That's my trivia question. Uh, we've got a couple responses saying the seeds. The seeds, yeah. So I'm not actually going to cut one open because I don't have any gloves. <laughs> but um, it, you know what it is? It's the pith. So you know the white part that the seed is connected to? That's actually the part that holds the heat. And then the seeds secondary. So the seeds do have heat. But if you want to reduce the heat, you actually want to get that whole like white part out of the pepper. And then that's where the heat is held. Okay, so I have some goodness happening in my pot. I'm going to bring it over to you to see. Oh, look at that. So everything is sweating really nicely, has really nice aroma. So now I'm just gonna start adding my vegetables. So uh, like I said, I have my variety of sweet potato and yam. I'm gonna add that in there. And what's cool is, I don't know, if there's like, you can see the, uh, this is the starch and it's really sticky from the yam. So when you cut open a yam, it's actually really sticky. Some people get a reaction from it and your skin might start to itch a little bit. But there's, that's okay. All you have to do is just um, like wash it with soap and then that sensation should go away. Okay, so I'm going to put my cassava in. So these are, I cut them all around the same size. And again, sometimes um, um, making this pot because it usually is cooking for a long time. 
sometimes we just like put really big chunks of, of vegetable into the soup. But um, because I want it to cook during the time that we're here, I cut them a little bit smaller so that everything cooks together. Okay, so I have, I'm putting my cassava in there. Um, what else do I have? Oh, I have another vegetable. I'm gonna see who knows this one. Who knows what this vegetable is? Any guesses? Um, someone said Edu. Edos. Edo. Yes. You're bang on. Edos. That's exactly what it is. It was another name for the Edos, but I don't remember. Um, I think it was like a, a Latin America, an, um, or maybe Brazilian name. I sorry, I don't remember exactly, but there was another name. So if anyone knows the other name for Edo, let me know what it is. So Edos are um again, they're like uh cores quorums um you know they grow in this uh, formation dashin or taro root they're in the same fat family um so um and they're quorums as well so they have like a slightly uh waxy texture to them um and uh it's a very dense vegetable the good thing about this soup is that it's extremely nu nutrient dense, as I think you can see that with all these wonderful whole foods and ingredients. And the good thing about it is, it's very low maintenance. So once I get everything into my pot, I'm going to add, um, you can use stock or water, or like I said, if you're going to use meat, you put your meat in there and that'll help flavor it. Um, I, I tend just to use water because if you really build the flavors in the pot itself, uh, I find you don't need that extra sort of salted um, stock unless I make it myself. Okay, so then I have a couple of things. I have a pumpkin. So this is sort of like we're being kind of pumpkin here. Um, that is more dry and starchy. So I like to put a balance of um, a little bit bitter, a little bit sweet, a little bit starchy uh, vegetables in the soup pot because then it just comes together really nicely and adds really great flavor. So I have that. I'm gonna put this in here as well. So these guys are going in. Now these are all really dense vegetables, so you really can cook them all at the same time. I do have a little bit of plantain. If you use a green plantain, you can put it in now, um, but because, and they'll cook at the same time. This one was more yellow, so it's really not gonna take a long time to cook. And I don't want it to be too sweet. Um, but I do like having a little bit of plantain in my uh, soup. So I'm going to put that there. Okay, so I have some more veggies here. This is all going in. This is my um, Caribbean sweet potato. That's what I have here. This is the Caribbean sweet potato. And that's going in. And I'm ready. I smell the love in the pot. Okay. So mixing all this together, our flavors are really starting to develop nicely. And I'm going to let that go before I add any liquid to it. I'm just going to still let it all like cook together, sprinkle a little bit of salt on top. Because these are really dense vegetables, you need to add a little bit of seasoning for it to penetrate. And I don't know if you've ever tried to cook potatoes without putting salt in the water, but they don't taste very good and they don't taste like very much. And the same with your vegetables, they have a little bit more flavor, um, but just a little pinch of salt will really enhance and bring out the flavor of all the vegetables that you put in there. I'm using um, a pink sea salt. Oh, sorry, no, a pink Himalayan salt. So I'm using that as my salt uh, because I like, I'm gonna turn that down. So I like using the pink Himalayan salt because it's full of minerals, okay? so. That's what I like to use it. It's more natural for, for your body. If you're using table salt and that's what you have, go for it. Um, table salt is really pro, uh, refined though, and they remove all of the nutrients. Salt is very high in many different um, nutrients, not only sodium chloride. And table salt is just reduced to the one sodium element, sodium chloride, and then iodine is added back into it so that um to help with thyroid function okay but 
if you get like a natural salt, like so this pink Himalayan uh, sea salt is mined. Uh, so in down in, in the hill, Himalayan, they go down, 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 I don't know how far. Uh, and then there's like this salt uh, formation in the caves. And then this is mined from there. And so it's just really full of nutrients that the salt would have obtained from the earth's crust. So we have all that goodness in here. Okay. So I just put a, a pinch and we'll taste it later, but just to get, get it started, that's going to happen. Okay. So origins, origins, origins. If anyone has questions, pop them in right now. No problem. And I can stop and answer. Let me know, Morgan, if anyone has any. We're going to use, so origins of our, our vegetables. So I'm not adding okra today, but I just wanted to share that okra and yam are native to that, the continent of Africa. And so are, these are um, split back black eyed peas or cow peas. They're either called cow peas or black eyed peas. And so these are sort of uh, ingredients that are native to the continent of Africa. Um, I believe, don't quote me, but I believe predominantly West Africa, which is how it, they got transferred over to the Caribbean during the slave trade. Okay, so um, that's part of it. So I'm gonna use, I like to use, I like to use the black right, the, the peas. I pre-cook them a little bit, again, just so they will cook faster in the soup. And so what I do is add this for protein uh, and also to speed up or to thicken the broth. So as they break it down, it's going to add really nice body and texture to our soup. Okay, so we, I'm going to use these and add this into the soup as well and then stir it up. It's going to be yummy. So, so far I have a pot of love happening in here. So I have most of my ingredients and in. I don't have the plant in and I haven't added my swatch on it just yet. But I'm going to give it a big stir um, and then I'm going to add some water and we're going to cover it down and let it simmer. So give it a stir. I will show you what it looks like. I'll bring it over again. Sort of before I've added the water. Okay, so if I come over here and I took my pot, look at that. Oh my goodness. How's that? Right. So all kinds of goodies in there. And the reason I'm still simmering it, is, again, like I said, I want to develop the flavor. The more that you let the onion and the garlic and the thyme and all those things cook together, the more flavor you're going to have. You don't want it to brown. You're going to have it at medium low heat. And then what's happening there is it's sweating. Just like when we sweat, <laughs> um, when we sweat, we like release uh, moisture and so do the vegetables. And so it's releasing moisture right now. Okay. So next up, we're going to add some water and I'm going to cover the vegetables, just cover them with the water. And as it's cooking, I'll see if I need to add more or not. Okay. So um, this is a very thick, hearty soup. And because of its simplicity, um, plantation owners, the diet of the Caribbean started to change from those elaborate feasts. And they started to change into more of sort of what the Negro diet was. And it started to do that because of the skill and the talent and the flavor that these women were able to put into the most simplest of ingredients. Okay, so that's the foundation. Now, depending on which island you're from. Okay, this is all full with water now. It's just floating the vegetables, and I'm going to um, cover it down in a sec, but I'm going to bring it up to a boil and then let it all just cook together, and then I will turn it down to a simmer. At this point, I'm going to throw one of these in for the flavor, and, uh, and then we'll scoop it out maybe halfway through the cooking time uh, and taste to make sure it's not too spicy. Um, so some people like really, really spicy. Uh, my, I am going to share this with my son and he's nine and not crazy about really hot food. So that's why I'll take it up midway through, but the, you do need a little bit of that heat to build the flavor. All right. 
Does anyone have any questions? Okay, I think we're good. Okay, so um, one more thing goes into our soup. So one thing that was given, so most of the time, um, people, so, so slaves were given uh, a piece of land, a small piece of land. Usually it was a very rustic piece of land and hard to maintain. However, that was called a provision ground. So each person was, um, each family was uh, allowed a piece of land to grow their own food. Because they started realizing um, somewhere around, I think I believe in the 18, mid 1800s, what they started to realize is if we, so people were not dying as much. So they're like, if we help these people to live and they actually start um, producing their own children, then they don't need to go back and, and get children or get people from Africa. They can kind of sustain the plantation on its own. So that was the idea behind giving um, slaves there's this piece of ground. So they thought, okay, we gotta feed them cheaply, we gotta house them cheaply, and how can we do this? And I always say that it's such a testament to the resiliency of um, Afro-Caribbean folks that from nothing, we can create something amazing. So much so amazing that that is what permeated the culture the elaborateness of the colonial um, banquets uh, sort of died away. And what was left was these really simple, delicious meals that we are familiar with today. And um, I don't know about you, but I, I think what I call someone who was, who was able to create a, a gourmet meal, a banquet feast, I call that person a chef. And I think um, a lot of the time, these women never received the um, respect and the honor that they deserve. Because if you go across to the, the Atlantic, over to the other side, um, you know, people were doing the exact same job, getting paid really well, and they got the notoriety and the um, prestige of being called a chef and a profession that, um, you know, had a lot behind it. So it's just things to kind of think about. When we say that there's um, racism in our food systems, these are the kind of things that, you know, should start our brains kind of ticking away and thinking, right? So um, how is my washing and seasoning my meat being told publicly that it is wrong? Basically calling out um, hundreds of years of culture and tradition and telling someone that this culture and tradition is wrong, but we'll turn around and we'll post videos as um, as chefs and you know, like I said, uh, talking about how amazing it is to brine your meat and you should never not brine your meat. So just things for us to think about. I wanted to share a couple more books with you while we're kind of waiting for our soup and. Um, before we hop into a video, we're going to do that next. Um, so this is called the, the President's Kitchen, this book. And I can share our resources with you. Um, it'll be posted after the video. So the President's Kitchen. So this is just outlining from uh, George Washington all the way to the Obamas that uh, b basically the people who cook in the President's Cabinet how are of Afro-Caribbean or Afro-American descent. Again, creating these amazing elaborate meals. And I can bet that these names are not known by any of us. So good things for us to kind of take a minute of pause and to think about. Okay, so we're just getting on to, we're almost at that time where we're gonna play a video, but I wanted to tell you how to make these dumplings first and then I'll share with you what the video is about. Okay, so our dumplings have flour. There's a cup of flour. There is a third of a cup of cornmeal. There's um, about half a teaspoon of salt. And there was a pinch of nutmeg and a tablespoon of sugar. So that's what's in here. And again, just to add more bulk and substance to kind of prolong and last people throughout the day, because oftentimes this Negro pot would be the only meal that you would enjoy. Um, that, that people could have 
out of the entire day. So it needed to be hearty, it needed to be substantial, and it needed to be able to last people. So in this bowl, um, so you'll find in most islands, there's going to be some kind of dumpling recipe, and that's what this is. So these are cornmeal dumplings. I have my water, and you're just going to add maybe two or three tablespoons of water, and you just want to um, create like a, or like a dough. So I'm adding a little bit at a time, and I'm going to create a dough. And the dumplings go in once the vegetables are almost done, and they take about 20 minutes to cook. So while we watch our video, I'm going to form these dumplings, and then I'll show you what everything looks like when we come back. Um, so the video is going to be an interview that was held between myself and Dresa Grant Hall, who is the uh, chairperson of NACA. Um, she'll share a little bit about what that organization is. And the reason we did that interview together was um, this class was done in a live format prior to COVID. And in that live format, it was very popular and it's very busy. And um, Dresa is the one who reached out to me at York Region Food Network to find out if I would be able to do a Black History Month presentation talking about our food, uh, food pathways, our culture, and kind of outlining these things. So that's how she became um, a part of this. And uh, unfortunately, she's not available today at this time. So what I thought would be good is if her and I just kind of sat down and chatted food together. Um, so um, on that note, we are gonna be just about ready. I wanna show you this dough and then we're gonna pop on that video. And it's about, I think it's about um, 30 minutes long, um, but it's engaging and we talk about different things. Uh, so I'd love for you just to listen to that. And then when we come back, save all your questions you can write them in the chat, and then for the last 15 minutes, I will be answering questions. Uh, we can have any kind of dialogue you want, um, and we'll take it from there. So I'm gonna need this a little bit more. Here's our dough. So it's just like a, a dough, dough, <laughs> a dough ball, and then you pinch it off. Now, some people make circles, make them into balls. Some people go like this, and they call them spinners. So whatever shape you want to create your dumplings, you can do that. All right, so we are right on time. I'm gonna form my dumplings, keep an eye on my soup, and then I will see you back after the video. Okay, so Morgan, if you could please get that ready. I will do that, uh, but first I just wanted to mention there is a comment in the chat box saying, uh, thank goodness for amazing chefs like you to teach our kids the new way of respect and thinking. And there's also another comment by the same person saying that, um, I think in reference to um, you making the dumplings, they said, um, yes, for us was coconut arepas, so. Yes, arepas, yes. Okay, so I'm just about to gear up this video. Just give me one second. Thank you for the, com the comments and the, uh, and the compliments as well. All right, so welcome. I am here with uh, Jerisa Grant Hall, and she is from NACA, the New Market Afro Caribbean Canadian Association. And I just want to say, uh, amazing welcome, welcome, welcome to you, Jerisa. Yes, 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 yes. And thank thank you. you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and just to talk about what your food story is, as we kind of explore this sort of Afro Caribbean uh, roots connected to food. So mm -hmm. before we get right into the meat of our conversation, can you just first tell us who you are and what NACA is all about and sort of how did we, um, our paths cross? Oh, you'll do a, probably a far better job explaining <laughs> how we are, but, but uh, definitely when you said before we get into the meat of this, I'm like, ah, oh. oh. <laughs> that sounds like uh, the pun is intended there. The, the but, pun yeah. is fully intended, yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you for inviting me, first of all, to do this um, presentation online, to bring uh, our food stories online. And uh, of course, like you said, my name is Jerisa Grant Hall. I am the chairperson for the New Market African Caribbean Canadian Association, NACA. Mm -hmm. And we're a registered nonprofit organization operating out of uh, the town of Newmarket. And we cater to the, um, the, the, the Black diasporic um, 
community here in um, New Market, but also beyond. Um, I like to say in your region, but uh, typically um, catering to the immediate community, of course. Of course. What we do, we do offer um, programs for youth and families in the community. Mm -hmm. One of the programs that we're currently running is our, our financial literacy workshop week program. This is our fifth week coming up this Thursday and, uh, and it's for six weeks. So that's one of the things that we're doing now. Uh, we also have a scholarship program. Uh, the deadline for that is coming up 31st of this month. And mm -hmm. it's basically providing scholarship awards to students who are going off to university for the first time. Amazing. Uh, yeah. So that's an amazing opportunity. It's great that uh, you're sort of looking out for the community in that way. Yes. Also, we have a summer student volunteer program. We also, for the first time, applied for uh, the Canada uh, summer student um, job opportunity. So we might have uh, a placement for, for the summer for one student. Uh, to offer um, employment opportunities. So, oh, great. Lots going on. Yes, yeah. definitely you have lots going on. And so, you know, during this crazy time of COVID, um, you know, we've all had to mm -hmm. kind of take our programs online. And this particular program is something that we were actually doing in person. Uh, so, I'm just going to backtrack yes. a little here. Um, so, Jerisa and I, we just met through our organizational communities. Uh, I was really excited to see NACA pop up sometime, I, was it last year or the year before? What, 2018. 2018. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, I was looking for, as the uh, culinary program director at York Region Food Network, I was looking for different organizations and, and communities to partner with to bring food programs. And I was super excited when I saw NACA. Uh, and so one of the main reasons was just to have um, that outlet for sort of our Afro-Caribbean uh, community to join and just to learn and to grow together. And the other part was our, we, we the Afro-Caribbean community is very like socially based, mm -hmm. very, um, and it's very connected around, mm -hmm. especially around food. Yes. Yeah. So yes, yeah. I was really excited uh, just to, to know that you were there and for us to kind of pursue things together. Um, and then you came to me to ask about this Afro-Caribbean workshop, if we can move that forward. And yes. uh, so super excited about that. And we did have a really successful first run. <laughs> yes, um, it was booked in. It was booked out that first workshop. I think it was February 21st or 22nd was that first one. And it was booked out uh, literally in a couple of days. And uh, we did try to collaborate again on a second one, a follow-up. And that was uh, booked out in less than 24 hours. So then we realized that this was definitely um, of interest to a lot of people. And um, we, did, uh, we, did, we did have to cancel the March um, and we also had one booked for me that was yes. also booked out pretty quickly. So, no. so, so I'm glad that you are able to bring this online this time. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So unfortunately, we're not going to have that in person where we get to eat and taste and feel yeah. um, and experience our culture full on. But mm -hmm. that being said, uh, it's just great that we have this opportunity to talk about and share kind of cool things about our culture and about our food. And so what's, what is your background, Teresa? your cultural background? My cultural background, I am, uh, I would say Afro-Jamaican. Okay. Canadian. <laughs> Born in Jamaica, spent, spent my entire child there and then moved here when I became an adult at 19. Okay. Yeah. At 19. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so then your culinary sort of roots uh, must go be like rooted in Jamaican cuisine. Can you share a little bit about what uh, Jamaican food and cuisine is like? Oh, um, I know that typically when, when you say Jamaica, 
what comes to mind when you talk about cuisine for a lot of people is jerk chicken, right? Um, and Jamaican patty. I, those are yeah. sort of like the commonplace um, references that people go, go to. Um, but there's, there's so much more um, to Jamaican cuisine. Uh, everything from the appetizers to the main course to the pastry to the to the dessert, uh, desserts after and the drink the punch and the sorrel and there's there's a rich uh, a rich variety and diversity in in and when we re really when we say Jamaican cuisine um, Jamaica itself is a diverse uh, culture. Yeah, and so it's not just the Afro-Jamaican cuisine, but also the Indo-Jamaican cuisine as well, because there's a different um, varieties of, of food and food culture that it coexists. I would say in the same place, but being an Afro-Jamaican um, uh, person of Afro-Jamaican heritage, I would say, of course. Uh, yes, a couple of days ago was Saturday and someone had called and, 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 I, and said, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm pretty good. I've been cleaning all day. And the person said, I bet you made, I bet you made soup because they, they know that I am of Jamaican <laughs> background. So, so the idea is on Saturdays in Jamaica, if you're a true Jamaican, you clean all day and you make a pot of soup. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, that's my, so what was in your soup? What was in the soup? I want to know. So I had yellow yam. Mm -hmm. We had um, peas in there. Uh, we had, uh, you, and you have to, you can't make soup without the scotch bonnet pepper. Yes. That's like gives it that nice flavor. Yeah. Uh, we had dumplings in there. Mm -hmm. um, it was vegetarian. So we didn't, we didn't add any, any meat this time, but mm -hmm. usually traditionally you'd add some, chicken parts, whether it's the chicken feet or um, the back or any part of the chicken, you can mm -hmm. put it in that soup. But this time we made it, uh, we made it vegetarian with yam and dumpling and peas and carrots and um, what else? Chocho. Mm -hmm. I think there's a different name for that here. Yeah. <laughs> it's okayo. Yes. Chayote. Chayote. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> Um, and some pumpkin was in there too. Yeah. Oh, see, that sounds delicious. That's such a common yeah. thing. Absolutely. The pot of soup goes on in the morning and then it's yes. there for anyone to come and dip out throughout the day, right? <laughs> yes, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> then you can just clean and you don't have to worry about stopping to cook or figure what's for dinner. <laughs> All in one pot. It's the one pot. The yeah. one pot. Um, so that's really cool. So you talked a little bit about um, like there's diverse cultures in Jamaica. So there is the Afro portion. And mm -hmm. then do you want to share a little bit about what those other influences are and how it plays on the food? Uh, so I know there's the Indian influence. Uh, there's something called dal mm -hmm. and roti, mm -hmm. curry. Mm -hmm. um, it's traditionally Indian mm -hmm. in Jamaica. And so one of the things that we've appropriated and used um, across cultures there is the curry yes. and um, the roti. Mm -hmm. There's Chinese, there's Chinese influence, there's Indian influences, um, there's um, European influences as well on the food. Yeah. Um, uh, I know there are, those are the main sort of more number wise, yeah, be more dominant ones, but of course, other influences there as well. Yeah, um, yeah, so that's totally like the essence of Caribbean food is this melting pot of different cultures yeah. coming together to create something like super amazing and delicious. So, just like the pot of soup, just like the pot of soup, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all different things coming together, thrown all together, and that's yeah. a good representation of sort of Caribbean culture is that pot. Um, mm -hmm. I think throughout all the islands, you're going to have a variation of that exact soup that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, which is really common. My dad likes to put goat meat in his. Yes. Yeah. You can pretty much put, you can put pork, beef, chicken, you can put anything in yeah. there. Some anything. people put uh, 
different types of meat. So some people will put beef and chicken, pork, mm -hmm. and, you know, so you can have a variety of um, fish. You could put fish. Yeah. Um, oftentimes when I make it, I put shrimp as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. See, a little bit of that's, that's the beauty of, of making soup. Yeah. Well, you know what? For the longest time, no way, like in the, so a common thing is that like recipes, oftentimes for a long time, there weren't actually recipes like written down. Um, True. Because part of the culture, I mean, part of it is from um, like a legacy of illiteracy that kind of the culture was sort of uh, founded. And then as time progressed, um, and so there was, we relied a lot on like oral and like verbal communication to pass down many things, whether it's the bush mm -hmm. medicines, the recipes, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Did you want to like share anything about that? And now we do have recipes written down that we can actually go back and, and read yes. the richness there. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, absolutely. So the, the food culture is, is, is very much historical based. As you know, Jamaica was a plantation economy, mm -hmm. um, meaning that sugar was uh, the main source of economic, that dro drove the economy um, back when um, Africans were enslaved. And so during that time, um, it was uh, the, the enslaved Africans basically used whatever provisions they would grow themselves in their gardens and uh, whatever uh, um, they call them provisions and whatever allotments they got right. for food. And so the soup came out of that history as well of, of uh, putting different provisions, ground provisions in that one pot. Um, the other part of the history is the, the part of the national dish is, is codfish. We mm -hmm. say saltfish. And also coming from a history of that economy, that colonial economy as well. And we know that um, the connection between Canada and Jamaica is uh, in, in terms of food history is around the saltfish. Because where did Jamaica get the saltfish from, which became their national dish? Mm -hmm. It was import, imported from Canada. Absolutely. And so uh, Canada is a part of that food culture, food history. Um, also, uh, like you mentioned about the herbal um, med medicine as well, when people get sick, um, they, they didn't have things written down. But if you talk, if you go far back enough, your grandmother, or your great grandmother, even my husband would always say, um, take this herb for this, because that's how he grew up with his grandmother, you, knowing what the different meanings of each um, uh, bush, you say yeah. bush or herbs mm -hmm. were for. Mm -hmm. And so people generally didn't um, go to the doctor a lot, uh, partly because they couldn't afford it and partly because uh, of, the, of the, um, the information that was handed down on, on different types of cures and um, remedies, as mm -hmm. we call them. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, uh, the um, something that we use here it's called lemongrass in jamaica we call it um a different name i think it's called fever grass mm -hmm. yes yeah, so so it takes on different names and different shapes <laughs> but the <laughs> lemongrass is an is a herb that we use very commonly when when you're sick or if you have a cold you would boil that down in water and and maybe sweeten it with some honey or sugar yeah and and drink drink that if you have a fever or come coming down with a cold common mm -hmm. cold so lots of significance even until this day is placed on and the home remedies yeah um, you you can't get a lot of people still to go to a doctor because they firmly believe in the in the herbs herbal yeah. medicine yeah and you know what, like, it's amazing because uh, where our ancestors, our grandmas, our great grandmas, where they derived that, that information, it was, they learned it. Yes. Themselves, right? Like they weren't taught, like they were taught from each other. Um, yes. And uh, so there's like, there's like, uh, like such a richness in the knowledge that exists. Mm -hmm. And yes. even as you speak of lemongrass, yeah, lemongrass is something that is for like digestion and like, yes. if you look now. This is what it's for. And um, the fact that these, um, 
these these women and it was predominantly the women who took mm -hmm. on that role of um of the the caretaker the medicine giver the mm -hmm. cooker the everything yes. yeah so there's like some yes. really strength and wisdom that comes from that that root and ancestry it's funny how you said you're saying woman because i i think the food history and culture in jamaica is is gendered and um very very gendered um most most times when you grow up and who is in the kitchen is always very uh, it's a gender based um space mm -hmm. um there are a lot of men that are fine cooks that have come out of those spaces uh from seeing women in the kitchen operating right but yeah. traditionally it's a very gendered space yeah mm -hmm. I, and it is i think um because going back to you're talking about the provision grounds um, it was predominantly the women mm -hmm. who were responsible for manning and or womening, <laughs> yeah, yeah. womening the, the provision grounds. And it was the women who also took uh, not only to prepare the meals for the family, but they also took some mm -hmm. of the harvest to share mm -hmm. within, uh, to trade, to trade at markets. Mm -hmm. um, so they, yes. they were entrepreneurial in that way and were able yes. to gain income to support their families, uh, a yes. little bit of income, but yeah. So there's, there's definitely some richness there. Thanks for bringing yes. that part out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. So Dries, I have a question. So yes. let's take a focus. So we know that food is such a huge part of our culture. Uh, and I say our culture, uh, because I, I, I too, I'm not from Jamaica, but I am from, my family is from Barbados and I grew up in Canada. Um, but just sort of that Afro-Caribbean community. Um, and so there is always uh, room at our table. Mm -hmm. There is always, that pot is big pot, even if there's three or four people in your house, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It is like a giant pot. Yes, yes. <laughs> so there's that giant pot because it's meant for community. Yes, yes, true. It's meant for if I'm walking on Saturday and I pass Teresa's house, I know yes. that I can go and get a little soup and then continue on my way. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> did you want to, so I'm just wondering, so, you know, this, this during our COVID-19 uh, time, there's a lot of that that's missing, that sort of sharing community and food. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how in your family have you been sort of addressing that? And how have you been, have you been looking at food within your mm -hmm. family? Oh, yes. Um, we have taken on ever since we had um, that social uh, with, 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 with that, we, that collaboration, I should say, um, for Black History Month. Um, we, we've taken everything that we've learned from that workshop with you, <laughs> and we brought that into our home. And during COVID-19, the stay-at-home order, we've taken a deliberate approach to harnessing that knowledge and bringing that experience even further. And start, okay. we've started to think about how can we preserve this? How can we pass this on? So it becomes a more of a deliberate um, action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that we know that historically, uh, my husband and I, we, we know what we know from the oral culture that was passed down, the recipes that were passed down. He has everything stored in his head. Uh, right <laughs> and so then the challenge is how do we during this time um pass this down so that it doesn't die with us right Absolutely. so yeah. i think that for us it's um it's preservation right mm -hmm. and so one, one of the things that our community um we must always continue to do is to continue the oral and remember that if we don't pass it on, if it stops with us, then it, it stops right there. Right. And so we, we took a deliberate, we, we took a deliberate turn um, to sort of make this food preparation, food knowledge, food activity um, every week. So every okay. week on Saturday, we bake, we cook, we share stories and we socialize and we get together and what it does it connects us it, it gives us something to look forward to 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the kids get really excited when they hear that we're going to be making <laughs> gizada <laughs> yeah. and cocoa bread and yes. making patty. They get super excited. And they, they, you know, my little, the little boy who is six, um, he remembers the workshop that we did during Black History Month. And he said, he said, um, he, he wants to get his hand in there and actually do the work and, and make the dough and, and make the shape. And, and, um, and he makes the connection between what he had learned at the workshop in, in, in February to what we're currently doing. And so um, we didn't really use or write anything down for them, mm -hmm. but we, we, we try to pass it through. We made a deliberate attempt to pass it on through the kinetics, through um, the body, yeah. and through our language. Yeah. And so that is, should be, a, yeah. <laughs> no, that's absolutely amazing. I'm really, really impressed to hear that <laughs> because you know what? It's so important, like you said, for us to, make sure that the culture, the, um, like it just as becomes part of us. Cause as, mm -hmm. um, like your, I guess your kids, you have two, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, your son is six and your daughter is 14, 14. So as your kids are like our kids, they're first generation Canadian, mm -hmm. but they're already kind That's of removed right. from the food and the culture. So it makes yes. it that much more important for you to share yes. that. Yes. Um, and then Absolutely. because then when they have kids, yes, these are the stories that they're going to now share. Right. And that's, yeah. that becomes a part of the, the memory, right. Mm -hmm. The food memory, right. Because yeah. we all have food stories and food memories. Yeah. Um, and so if we're preserving it, whenever we're talking culture, there's no such thing as culture with no food. <laughs> food is culture. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> You're food absolutely is right. Culture. And so when we talk culture, and, and I think one of the um, challenges in our community, especially among uh, Canadian born um, children is, is this idea of who am I? Yeah. What's my culture? How do I distinguish myself as um you know, culturally speaking, how do I identify? And it's, it's a real challenge. And I think food is one way in which we can reinforce that sense of identity and place and yes. history um, and, and the richness of food. Like it, there's so much rich, richness in there. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that becomes their food memory. So I'm hoping, you know, when they have children, they'll be able to say, you know, this is what we did on Saturdays with mom and dad. And this is how we made, this is how we made it. And yeah. we're going to pass it on to you. Right. Yeah. That's great. Cause you know what? I remember uh, during our presentation that we did um, back in February, I remember your daughter speaking because I asked the question, mm -hmm. what is one of your favorite food memories? Mm -hmm. And your daughter actually said her favorite food memory or one of was making gazadas with your husband, with her dad. Yeah, with her dad. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so he, he's, uh, he's always been hands-on with the kids when it comes to food culture. But I think we weren't as deliberate as we should or we could be. Um, and, and, and so I think what this experience has taught us is how to be more intentional and how to sort of make it become more of a part, a more part of our routine, more part of the, you know, so it's interesting when she said that because it shows that she, even though, you know, they may have had those experiences in the past a couple of times here and there that it stayed with her, right? Yeah. It stayed with her yeah. so that she could recount that and mm -hmm. talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I think, we, we have to be purposeful, a little bit more purposeful and say, you know what, I'm going to be, I'm going to make this a part of our, tra our family tradition now, yes. right? So that it's, it becomes even more cemented, you know, in their minds. And so they can make their own recipes without us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and it's teaching survival too. I think one of the side benefits, one of the latent benefits of that is I learned how to bake. Mm -hmm. I learn how to cook, right? Mm -hmm. um, I go off to university. I know how to cook. I know how to bake, right? <laughs> I will survive. I will survive. I will survive. 
I will survive. So I think for us, it's, we want our children to be independent. Yeah. Um, and, and we want them to be full. We want to, we want them to be full human beings mm-hmm. and explore the, their full self. And so we have to, we have to be able to go there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's amazing. And you know, it's, it just speaks to you with our kids because I, I bet up, up until that moment, your husband didn't realize how significant that, that, that was for her. Right. I would and, say so. And which goes to what you're saying, just about the need to be intentional mm-hmm. um, because we don't know what they latch on to. Yes. Yes. And you, you least expect with, with kids, you don't know, you, you, you may think, oh, they're not, they're not really going to remember this, um, you know, but they do. Mm-hmm. What, what they do when they recount it later on, you're like, oh, she did pay attention. <laughs> she did, you know, <laughs> yeah. they do remember these things. Yeah. And, um, and, and it, it, it helps you to connect as a family as well. Mm-hmm. So that's what I like about that. People, you can connect with each other around food. Yeah, that's absolutely mm-hmm. true. And yeah. so actually, before we kind of like finish up, one thing though, because we've been talking about gazadas, and I don't know yes. if everybody who's listening actually knows what that is. <laughs> Can you share so, what is a gazada? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a pastry mm-hmm. um, made with the, the, it's a kind of like a cup that you make out of flour, flour and water. You make a dough. Mm-hmm. And when you make, you make a, a kind of like a cup, and then inside, it's like a filler on the inside. Okay. And then it's coconut cooked a little bit with some sugar and some vanilla and nutmeg. And you put that into the flour dough cup that you've created mm-hmm. and put it in the oven for maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And so when it comes out, it's this kind of like, it's a, a cup, a dough cup with coconut filling. It's, Pretty, pretty amazing. Kids love it. Yeah, they're absolutely <laughs> delicious. If you delicious. like coconut, you're going to love gazada. And if yes. you haven't had one, you need to have one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, kind it's of, kind. Of, it's like a tart, right? Like a like a coconut. Exactly. Tart. Exactly. One of one of the children's favorite. I want to share this favorite uh, recipe. That it's a no fail. I don't know. My son's very picky when it comes to traditional uh, Jamaican food. Uh, he's not big on soup mm-hmm. and uh, he'll make a deliberate effort to avoid having the soup, <laughs> <laughs> but there's no other food. So he ends up having to have the soup. <laughs> yes. And so one food in particular, that's always has always been a staple that we, we always tend to make because it's, it's a no fail. Mm-hmm. especially with children they won't refuse it <laughs> i like this. this i like where this is going i like where yes, this is going they, they won't refuse um, and like i said my son's very picky when it comes to but this one you can be very much uh guarantee that any child born here um of of, of that kind of heritage would would latch on to that kind of food and it is drum roll <laughs> It's uh, it's it's dumplings. Dumplings, dumplings. yes. Um, so <laughs> in, back in Jamaica, they say Johnny cakes. Mm-hmm. Right? Johnny cakes. You hear the word Johnny cake. You hear fried dumpling. Mm-hmm. But without fail, because on Friday I, I get the kids to choose what would you like for dinner, and without fail, fried dumpling. So it's very simple. Mm-hmm. It's it's you put it's a, a four cups of flour. I'm writing this down. Sh- <laughs> four cups of flour. <laughs> yeah. A quarter cup of sugar. We use brown sugar. Okay. Um, in our in our house, uh, so it's four cups of flour, four, a quarter cup of brown sugar, two tablespoons of of um, baking powder, mm-hmm. uh, a table uh, sorry a teaspoon of salt. Um, four tablespoons of butter. I use coconut oil, mm-hmm. um, but you can use butter. If you have um, some melted butter, you can use four tablespoons of that. Okay. Um, and then you can use a cup of, uh, we use almond milk, but if you have 
dairy milk, that's also fine. Whatever milk you use in your home, yeah. you can use a cup of that to make the dough. So it's really just a little bit of sugar, flour, salt, butter, um, um, and, uh, and some milk to mm-hmm. make the dough and, and some oil for mm-hmm. frying. And you make them in little balls or different shapes, whatever shape. Sometimes mm-hmm. I get the kids to make different shapes and, and I pop them in there. Yeah. And when they're a nice golden brown, that's how you know they're done. Ah, oh, thank you. That. Yeah. Yeah. I will include that recipe because I do love a fried dumpling myself. Uh, yes. And so this is great. You know what? You, you can't go wrong. You can't go. You, you can can't eat them by wrong. themselves. You can put butter in it. You can dip it yes. in some gravy, like whatever. Yes. It's good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Teresa, I just want to say thank you so much for hanging out with us, sharing yes. your food story um Mm -hmm. and just being a part of the dialogue uh it's wonderful to have you and just to learn a little bit about your family and about jamaican culture and cuisine oh well thank you maxine thank you so so much for inviting me to the table to be a part of this space and this this dialogue it's uh it's important work sharing is caring (laughs) that's that's what my kids say and so when we share um, with our community um, that we pass on that knowledge we pass on that history this is how we preserve culture this is our preserve we preserve community so thank you for having me thank you so much Teresa you're welcome <laughs> all right so we're back I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview that we had um, it's just great to kind of hang out and, and talk food So we're just down to our last 10 minutes. Uh, So if anyone has any questions for me or any questions about what you heard, um, we will be posting the recipes gradually and they, you can find them on our York region food network, Facebook and Instagram pages. Uh, So you'll see them kind of trickling through with some photos and description. Our soup just was timed perfectly. And I'll just give you a peek here. Oh, can you see the goodness? I don't want it to spill. <laughs> but you can see it becomes like a really thick kind of stewy kind of soup. Um, the dumplings are cooked. I added the, I took out the, um, I don't know if you all saw when I took the scotch bonnet out, maybe halfway through. So it just has a little bit of heat to it, which is quite nice. Uh, and then I added the plantain maybe um, in the last, 10 minutes of cooking and the um i added the dumplings in the last 15 minutes of cooking so and that's it so you just let it go you just saw i cleaned up <laughs> i did what i had to do and now the soup is on and it's just ready and so this is often what you would find you come to someone's house the soup is there on the pot you just help yourself very casual uh and then we enjoy it so does anyone have any questions or comments that you would like to share uh, will the recipes include the dumpling recipe? Uh, the one that Jerisa spoke about? Yeah. 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 So I will post uh, the soup uh, mm-hmm. with including the how to make the seasoning. Um, and we will have how to make the dumplings that went into the soup. We're going to post the dumpling recipe uh, that Jerisa shared, uh, as well as the gazada recipe that we talked about, but we didn't actually go through what the, like how to, the, ingredients. So those are the three recipes that we're going to be sharing after this um, Zoom call. Are there any other questions or tidbits? Okay, so um, I have a question for you. So does anyone want to share what their food, favorite food memory is. Does anyone want to share what your favorite food memory is? No takers? (laughs) Okay, so I just wanted to highlight the food memories really make a difference. And I liked um, what Jerisa said just about being intentional about sharing our culture with our kids. So I'm not sure um, if anyone uh, 
uh, has immigrated to Canada. I can't, I can't see anybody, so <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone has immigrated to Canada or if you are originally from here. Um, but um, right now, in regardless of where, what your cultural background is, we are writing that same food story indirectly for our children. So um, take a minute and think about what is it that I want them to know about food and our family and our culture and how am I going to help create those memories for my children, if you have children, of course, um, or even how am I gonna start to develop my own food memories for myself? So one thing I found is I, what I love about living in Toronto well, I live in York Region, but just uh, I used to live down in the city. But one thing I love is the diversity of our city. So I really appreciate that because we get to experience so many different foods, cultures, and cuisine. And it's not something that's very common, um, you know, like any, uh, other places in the world. So I do really love that. But what I've noticed is it's really easy then to forget or for our, our own stories to get lost in that hustle of enjoying so many different foods and, and cultures. So there is an intentionality that needs to be put forward if we want to maintain that um, connection and that sense of community with our food and with our, with our kids. So that's just a little tidbit um, that I wanna leave you with. What do you want your food story to look like? So Matthew, um, there's yes. a couple of comments here. So one person says, thank you so much. This was fantastic and I learned so much. And then they mentioned that um, a part of their food memories um, is all their mom's home cooked meals. Um, and then there was another person that said, I can smell the codfish with boiled corn dumplings with my grandpa. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right? So it's like, those are the beautiful things that we want to write. Um, we want to, we want to, because it takes us back to different times. It takes us back to uh, different places and to different people. And there's this beautiful connection there. Um, Teresa made a great comment. There is no culture without food. So I often think about what does that look like for my son? So I'm first generation Canadian uh, of Bayesian and Barbados descent. So uh, both my family, both my parents immigrated here from Barbados in the 60s, in the late 60s, uh, when um, the Trudeau government uh, senior uh, had opened up the borders to allow people from the Caribbean to come freely into Canada. So I don't know if you know this, but prior to that, it was it was not even possible for um, uh, Caribbean people to come to Canada unless they were coming with someone to work either the railroads or to work um, in their homes or to work like for someone. So just people coming and moving. So <clears throat> we're just like grateful for that. And that sort of that, that road um, has been paved now that people can come freely to this country um, if they choose to. And um, so they came in, in the late uh, 60s and, you know, and then I was born in some other decade, <laughs> which I'll keep to myself right now. But, um, but yeah, so I was, uh, and so I'm first generation Canadian. I have a brother who's also first generation Canadian. So my son at this point is second generation Canadian. And so it just started just kind of clicking in my head that that um, how important that intentionality is for him to stay connected to his culture, because we don't live in a predominantly Caribbean uh, neighborhood, but we have a very large family. Um, so you know what I mean? He has so many influences from many different places. And uh, though I want him to have those experiences and just my overall love for food um, makes that something that I really want him to partake of and enjoy. But then I also want him to know that, you know what, you are of Caribbean descent as well as Canadian and, um, and sort of help him to build an identity in what that means. So we do have a couple more minutes. So if anyone has questions or you want to chat or whatever, you can totally shoot that out there. But I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today for um, just being a part of my food story and just uh, listening to what I have to say. Black history is more than 400 years old. It is since the beginning of time. And there's so much richness there that we need to learn. 
um, and, um, and how much uh, the Afro-Caribbean diaspora has influenced the world is very um, prominent, but it's also very kept in, in secret. Um, the narrative that's told is a narrative that people want us to know. But prior to those 400 years, there was great civilizations and kings and queens and, um, and Africa is one of the most wealthiest planet as far as like resources and strength and resilience in people. And so it's such a beautiful place for us to explore and to learn more and more about. So I hope everyone kind of takes this as a challenge to go ahead, move forward and to do that. I hope you've enjoyed yourself here today. Um, I'm sorry you can't actually eat my soup, but this is my dinner and it is cooked. So I'm happy for that. And uh, until we are able to cook in person once again, I look forward to seeing you then. Somewhere, if there's no more questions or comments, I'm just gonna say thank you everybody. And I'm gonna give a little one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Some thank yous coming in and someone saying challenge taken. Thanks. Nice. Yes. Embrace that challenge. And I want to hear all about it. So either shoot me an email or tell us on our Facebook page um, and just enjoy yourselves. So go forth, people. Enjoy this beautiful day. Thank you so much for sitting with me um, and listening to my food story.